Hello, my name is Elizabeth Weber, and I'm going to be talking about otolaryngology, head and neck surgery, otherwise known as ear, nose, and throat. So as an overview, we'll talk about the scope of practice of otolaryngology. Many people don't know what an ENT surgeon does, so we'll spend some time exploring the field. Then I'll talk about what I love about otolaryngology, and we'll talk about the specifics you should know when considering applying to oto, including the required and suggested electives. Then I'll provide you an overview timeline about the things you should be thinking about during each year of medical school. Then I'll discuss letters of recommendation, who to ask and when to ask. And lastly, we'll discuss how to make yourself competitive, fellowship opportunities, and I'll share some other helpful resources. So what does an otolaryngologist do? What, do, what is ENT? Well, we really operate anywhere from the clavicles to the skull base. That whole area is essentially our playing field. And uh, you may have encountered an otolaryngologist before when you had your tonsils removed, maybe, or if you had ear tubes placed. Uh, maybe you broke your nose at one time and got a deviated septum, so you went to an ENT to have your breathing um, evaluated and fixed. Uh, or we also manage um, recurrent nosebleeds, epistaxis issues, or maybe just a nosebleed that was having trouble being managed by emergency room doctors. We get consulted for those types of issues frequently. Also, we manage tracheostomies and we perform tracheostomies, which is a tube placed into the trachea to help with breathing. And those can be done for a variety of reasons, but that's one of the main things that we uh, manage. So all of these things are really broad and uh, general things that we do in ENT and things that we are most known for, but there is so much more than that. So we're going to dive into each of these briefly. In the area of head and neck, we are often working up patients that present with a neck mass, and that could either be from a congenital issue like a branchial cleft cyst or an infection, a cancer spreading in a lymph node known as a lymph node metastasis. Additionally, we deal with salivary tumors, and as you can imagine, this one, a parotid tumor, may be very difficult to remove because of how intertwined the parotid gland is with the facial nerve. Additionally, we perform laryngectomies, which is removing the voice box, and that also entails rerouting the airway. As we can see here, air is able to pass in and out of the mouth or the nose, but after removing the voice box, air is only able to pass through a stoma through the skin. Additionally, we manage and um, reconstruct individuals that have undergone head and neck cancer. So as you can imagine, with this mandibular cancer, after removing that tumor, we may very well have had to take out part of the mandible. So how do we reconstruct that mandible? And one way that we can do that is through a free tissue transfer, otherwise known as a free flap. So here we are able to take the fibula and the muscle and the skin and the artery and vein that go alongside that bone and use the bone to reconstruct the mandible as seen here. So we cut it in um, particular angles so that it bends um, just in the shape of the mandible. We then plate it and use the blood vessels that it came with from the fibula and attach the artery and vein to the artery and vein in the head and neck area. That way that tissue we just harvested can then be perfused. So pretty cool surgery. In the area of rhinology, we are working with the nose, sinuses, and anterior skull base. Here is an example of a common issue, a polyp problem, uh, which is obstructing drainage from, say, the maxillary sinus. So we can go in endoscopically, which is with a camera and a light and instruments, and remove that polyp. Or maybe a patient has an anatomical issue with their sinuses where it is not allowing proper drainage. So we can go in and remove ethmoid sinuses or uh, overgrown turbinates so that it opens up those sinuses better. Additionally, we work closely with neurosurgery for issues of the anterior skull base or uh, potentially issues within the cella region like a pituitary tumor. And as you can see on the image on the left using the CT scan, we can perform image-guided surgery where the middle of those cursors is actually the point of an instrument, like a suction. And using uh, the, Im the preoperative images, we can make sure we know where we are while we're performing these surgeries. In the field of otology or neurootology, we are treating issues of the ears or lateral skull base. 
And as you can imagine, we work closely with audiologists since we are helping patients with problems with their hearing. Uh, one of the most impactful procedures that we can do is cochlear implantation, which we can do not only in babies, but maybe in elderly individuals that have hearing issues refractory to their hearing aids. Also, we diagnose and manage patient, patients that present with dizziness issues. That bottom picture is an example of vestibular testing, where we can um, run some tests to try and figure out what the source of the balance issue is. Also, we perform microtia work, uh, re microtia repair, which is a congenital abnormality of the ear. We can repair damaged ossicles from chronic ear disease or trauma. And then again, we work closely with neurosurgery uh, to um, help resect tumors of the lateral skull base like this one. Next in the field of laryngology, this is the management of the voice box. So as you can imagine, we are helping patients that present with voice issues, which yes, sometimes is just an average patient, and then sometimes it's a professional voice user or a public speaker. And because we are helping to treat the voice, we work very closely with speech language pathologists, which are essentially the physical therapists of the voice. Also, we diagnose and manage issues of swallowing and uh, potentially chronic laryngitis issues, or maybe uh, their voice concerns are because of a vocal fold polyp or nodule, or maybe even a cancer. Those are all things that we would work up in the field of laryngology. Up next is the field of facial plastics, which is ubiquitous throughout our training. We are operating in a very high real estate area. The face and the neck, both are areas that are very visible. So we have to learn how to operate in a very aesthetically efficient manner by hiding scars in skin folds and in wrinkles uh, such as this one. So this is an example of maybe a skin cancer that was on the upper lip and we can rearrange the tissue to hide their scar in their nasal labial fold. Additionally, we can diagnose and manage facial fractures, cleft lips and palate repairs. We can perform facial reanimation for say a Bell's palsy patient or stroke patient. Uh, additionally, more on the cosmetic side, we can perform hair uh, transplants. Uh, yes, we do both functional rhinoplasties, but we can also do cosmetic rhinoplasties and facelifts. So the field of facial plastics is very broad. We also perform thyroid and parathyroid surgery for issues such as uh, thyroid cancer or multinodule goiter, uh, hyperparathyroidism, and the key with uh, operating on the thyroid or parathyroids is its relationship with the recurrent laryngeal nerve. And as you might remember, that nerve is what innervates the voice box. And damage to that may cause problems with someone's voice, or it could also be something so severe as issues with airway control. As you can imagine, if your vocal folds aren't moving as they should be, you could have an obstructed airway. A newer area of otolaryngology is sleep surgery, where we are operating on individuals with severe refractory OSA. And the goal of our surgeries are to open up the posterior or oropharynx more. So here uh, is an example of a uvulopalatopharyngoplasty. Uh, and another um, possible surgery that we can perform is a maxillomandibular advancement. Uh, so both of these surgeries have the goal of providing more posterior pharynx patency. So what initially drew me to otolaryngology was the anatomic complexity. I love a head and neck anatomy. I feel like I could study it for hours. And I really appreciate that in the OR, we have to be very meticulous and deliberate about how and where we operate because of how close we are operating to the cranial nerves. And damage to any of those can cause devastating effects on a patient. Also, I really enjoy the operative breadth. We can go from operating underneath a microscope for ear surgery or voice box surgery to doing some of the biggest procedures in the hospital, which is like that fibular free flop I showed you. Also, I am particularly interested in cancer care and as opposed to say breast surgery where the general surgeon might go in to do the mastectomy, but then the plastic surgeon does the reconstruction. I really appreciate that in Odo, we can do both. We not only take out the cancer, which is that ablative piece, but then we also do the reconstruction. 
And we deal with a diverse patient population. Not only are we managing little tiny infants, but we also have patients that require end of life care. Uh, we are able to build longitudinal relationships with our patients because many of them have um, multi-step procedures or maybe they're being seen uh, for many years for their chronic issues. Also, we are the airway experts, which I think is pretty rad. Uh, whenever the anesthesiologists have an issue with an airway, they're not able to intubate a patient. We are the people that they call. As you may have noticed in the previous slides, it is a very collaborative field. We're working closely with speech language pathologists and audiologists, neurosurgery, um, just a variety of different fields, which I really enjoy. Also, I am particularly interested in global health opportunities, and this is available not only from a mission, st mission side of things with regard to cleft lip and maybe ear surgery and thyroid surgery, there's lots of avenues there. But then particularly I'm interested in education and I feel like that is one gap that um, needs to be fill filled is uh, providing education to international providers in the field of otolaryngology. Now let's dive into some of the specifics. I'd say about 90% of residency programs are five years long and they typically require about three to six months of required research. However, some programs are longer depending on how much of a research time they require. So for example, the University of Washington has four residents per year. Three of those residents complete one year of research, meaning that they are six years in total for their residency. And then the other resident has two years of research, meaning that they now have seven years of residency. And I would say on average, um, there's about one to five residents per year with probably about uh, three to four being the average. And the average salary is about 400,000. You, you typically make less in academics, which means you're working it with the university and helping to train residents versus working in a private practice setting. And then the average week of an otolaryngologist really varies. I'd say uh, it's about two to three days of clinic time with also two to three days of OR. It really just depends on how you run your practice. I've seen um, otolaryngologists have four days of clinic, one day of OR. And then I've seen some with four days of OR and only one and a half days of clinic or something like that. So it really just depends on how you run your practice. Next, as far as the electives go, the only required elective that the University of Washington has is that you take your otolaryngology sub I at UW. And that is primarily not only so that you can see how a high volume residency program is ran, but then also so that you can get your letters of recommendation from the faculty there after having worked with them uh, for a month. As far as suggested electives, away rotations are not required. However, I would highly recommend them, uh, particularly if you have a specific program that you're interested in or that maybe your significant other is also interested in or if you have a regional preference that doesn't necessarily have any other ties. For example, if you're really interested in uh, moving to New York or to Boston, uh, then I would recommend you do an away there so that uh, you can get to know the faculty, they can get to know you, and that way when your application comes across their desk, they're more likely to offer you an interview. Some home electives that are suggested include surgical ICU. Uh, we work closely with neurosurgery and cardiothoracic surgery, as well as plastic surgery can help give you some opportunity to work on your technical skills as well. I apologize, this is somewhat of a busy slide, but it's essentially an overview of medical school. What are the things you should be doing in each year to make yourself the most competitive? Uh, so during MS1, MS2 year, really your main thing should be studying hard and getting a competitive step one score. I feel like that's self-explanatory. Uh, in between um, the summer of first year and second year, I really recommend that you get involved with research that is publishable and no, it does not have to be Odo related. Um, many people get hung up on that and they just want to see that you are uh, interested in research and that you have been involved in projects that you have helped carry to fruition and um, that's really it. So don't worry if it's not Odo related. I also did a lot of exploration with specialty preceptorships, so if you have that opportunity at your site, I really recommend that you do that. It's super low stakes, you're not graded, nobody really cares if you are an awesome student or not. Just go and explore and see if you like it. Uh, during third year, do well in your clerkships, clerkships of course. Um, during your elective block, I really recommend that you do something productive as much as you might want to do a vacation. Um, if you can get involved with the otolaryngology uh, faculty at UW, that is really ideal. 
Um, I personally did an Odo rotation at UW during third year and it was really low stakes. People didn't care if I got things right or um, if I was an awesome med student or not. Um, they knew that as a third year, you're just trying to figure things out. Also during that time, I was able to get involved with some of the faculty at UW and uh, get involved in some research that I was able to get published. Uh, and then as a breakdown for the quarters during the summer, obviously work on your research. Um, during the fall is when you want to start planning for any away rotations that you might be interested in. Uh, I recommend using Frida, which I'll have the link at the end of this presentation, um, which is a way that you can look into different residency programs. Uh, VSAS, which is, I believe, Visiting Student Application Service, is a way that you can apply for away rotations. Uh, and some some programs require you to write a personal statement. It doesn't have to be awesome, just has to be something. Uh, and then they also, some of them require letters of recommendation. So just begin thinking about who you might like to ask letters from. Uh, then in the winter time is when you apply for a ways. I think the deadline for those are like late February, early March. I'm not sure. You'll have to look into it. Um, and then during the spring, you'll take step two, CK, and maybe CS. Some people took CS in the spring. Some took it in the late summer. Um, and then you'll do your home Odo sub I. Then uh, in MS4 year during the summer, you'll likely be on away, away rotations or doing more sub eyes at home. Um, you'll be finalizing your research and begin your ERAS application, which is Electronic Residency Application Service, I believe. And that uh, opens in June or July. So you can um, open that up and start inputting all your stuff so that everything is really good when you go to submit it. And then as far as asking for letters of recommendation, that'll typically be in late July, early August. And then for the fall, you'll submit your ERAS mid-September. Some people do a ways in the fall as well. Um, it's not uncommon, but you don't have to. Uh, and then as far as when you receive your interview invitations, uh, so like I said, you submit your application in mid-September, but then typically you won't receive any invitations until late October which is vastly different from like family medicine or internal medicine where they begin receiving interview invitations like right after their application submitted. So don't stress if you haven't heard by like mid-October, but by the end of October, you should have a few interviews rolling in. Uh, and then interviews typically start in late November. They end in late January. We submit our rank list in mid-February and then match date is in March. Mm. In regard to letters of recommendation, you have to submit three that are required and then there's a maximum of four, one of which has to be from your home department chair, which for the University of Washington, that's Dr. Futran. And I would really recommend that while you are on rotation, whether it's your home rotation or if you're doing it in a way that you set up an appointment ahead of time with that chair to sit down, talk about your CV, your aspirations, and allow them to get to know you a little bit. That way, when you go to ask them for a letter at the end of your rotation, they have a little bit more to um, go off of when they go to write your letter, and hopefully that will mean a more personal letter. Um, some other letters you might seek out uh, are from ones of other otolaryngologists. Those are ones I'd recommend, um, one of which being your research mentors, who might be able to speak towards your work ethic and personality. And just remember that otolaryngology is a very small field. So it's it can be very important to get letters from people that are very well known, such as editors of a certain journal or presidents of a society, if you can. Um, those can really help open some doors for you. Otherwise, you might think about getting a letter from another surgeon that works closely with otolaryngologists, such as neurosurgeons or plastic surgeons, things like that. Um, just somebody that knows you well. And then keep in mind that all letters have to be uploaded by the 1st of October. And while I said earlier, ERAS isn't due until the 15th of September, there is that two week um, kind of grace period, if you will, for authors to get their letters in. So start at, you want to ask for your letters at the end of your rotation, but you want to submit to them all of your documentation um, about mid-July, early August timeframe. So you give them a good amount of time to put together a good letter. And then keep in mind, you can mix and match your letters. So while you can only submit a maximum of four, you can't, you might have like, I don't know, you might be awesome and have 10 letters. Um, and you can really tailor those letters to particular programs. 
So you can kind of strategize to the best of your capability. Otolaryngology is a competitive subspecialty. So let's talk a little bit about how to make yourself competitive. Step one, of course, you want to get a great score there. Uh, the 2018 match data showed the average matched applicant got a 250 and the average unmatched was a 241. As you can see here, the blue line is the matched, the green is the non-matched, and the, the non-matched really is quite broad, uh, really low 240s to mid 220s. So I, I would say though that if you don't have that great of a step store, step score, it's not the end of the world for you. You just have to maybe uh, get some more research under your belt, do really well in your clerkships and um, all of those other things. I really recommend you express interest early. Even if you're just considering the field, I'd reach out to your departmental advisor, which for UW is Dr. Ian Humphreys. With any research that you're involved in, own it, get it done, submit it for conferences and get it published. You know, it's really daunting. It's a lot of work, but um, your mentors will help walk you through the process. They'll hold your hand um, and just really make sure you get it done. That's the number one thing I could say. The more pubs you have, the better you can make your application. Um, honor your clerkships, of course, especially your surgery rotation and any of your sub eyes. However, if you don't honor your surgery rotation, like I said, it's not the end of the world. Um, you can do other things to boost your application. AOA is the honors of medical school. So if you're able to get that, it really is a gold star. Uh, and it is, you are, are elected for AOA dependent on a, quite a few factors, one being grades, um, and then your research that you've done, as well as uh, primarily being your service learning. So how you have impacted your community. And I would really just recommend that everyone maintain their involvement in service learning throughout their medical school. And then maybe you're um, coming towards third year and you're like, well, I don't know how competitive of an applicant I might be. Um, one thing you might consider is expanding a year. I actually, probably more than half of the applicants I met on the trail had expanded. Um, and that allows you to get a whole bunch of research done as well as really do some hard decision making about what you want to go into. As far as fellowship opportunities go, it's really just dives into each of the different fields that we just talked about. So there's head and neck, microvascular recon, uh, rhinology, otology, laryngology. You can do a uh, fellowship just in pediatrics, uh, working on like airway reconstruction, those types of things. Then there's facial plastics, sleep, endocrine, and then you could do a fellowship just in research if you're really interested in getting involved in that realm. Some helpful resources that I used throughout med school included Headmirror, which is actually a beautiful website created by residents for students and residents looking to explore more of otolaryngology. Otomatch is essentially the student doctor network of otolaryngology. It's where you can get anonymous advice and um, search through previous years of match data and things of that nature, but just um, recognize that it is just like student doctor network. So really take or leave any advice that you see on there. Uh, AOA puts out a document each year called Pearls of Wisdom, which gives you tips for success on rotations. Um, and there's tons of great info in there, not on just otolaryngology, but in general. Uh, then Frida is a uh, database of residency programs that's put out through the AMA, the American Medical Association. And I believe that it's free. Um, you have to be an AMA member. Oh, I'm not sure. But I loved it. I highly recommend it, um, especially when you're looking for away rotations or when you go to look at residency programs uh, for applications. And then lastly is the NRMP match data. That's where I got that um, graph earlier. I really recommend looking at their statistics and um, just trying to make yourself the most competitive applicant you can. Lastly, feel free to contact me, whether you need advice, some mentorship, or just need some help getting connected in the field. I'm more than happy to help. Uh, and remember that you can pick your nose, you can pick your friends, but you can't pick your friend's nose unless you go ENT. Good luck, everybody.